Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Rebecca Goldberg. I am a labor and employment attorney with Birch and Moses, and we are here today to talk about mental health issues in the workplace, whether it deals with hiring, firing, everything in between. Uh, today, we have a great program for you. It's employee mental health complying with state and federal laws. This is a topic that has um, a lot of interest, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns about how do I approach a situation um, tactfully, respectfully, and legally. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we do have a lot of content to get through, and you may find that some of your questions are answered later on in the program. Uh, so you can type your questions into the Q&A feature as they come along, but just be aware, I may not answer the questions until uh, later on if I see that it's going to be addressed. And I wanna make sure we have time to get through everything. So, uh, first of all, over here, you'll see my contact uh, information, my email address, rgoldberg at birchandmoses.com. So if you have any questions after the program, or if you think that uh, we might have some work to do together, please reach out to me. Um, additionally, you, you'll see the link for our blog, the Connecticut Labor and Employment Law Journal. That's a free resource for you where we write about all sorts of helpful human resources topics. So please uh, feel free to go on and peruse and sign yourself up for the blog. What we'll cover today is um, identifying when a mental health issue is affecting the workplace, uh, knowing how to talk about mental health issues, and do, again, doing so tactfully and legally. Uh, we'll talk about how to accommodate employees while maintaining the needs of the workplace and complying with all legal requirements. We'll talk about uh, the rights of employees to take leave uh, for mental health issues. We'll talk about how to avoid abuse of the system, which um, unfortunately is something we do see a fair amount, especially uh, through my practice. That's what people come to me and ask me about the most. And we'll go through some scenarios to figure out how these situations might play out in real life. So how do you even know if an employee is dealing with a mental health issue? Sometimes they'll tell you. Sometimes they may kind of come straight to you and say, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling anxious, I have a mental health condition, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. And if they notify you, then you're aware of the situation and can start dealing with it and there's less guesswork to it. But sometimes employees either don't recognize when they're having a mental health issue in order to be able to raise it, or they may have some discomfort around the idea of talking about their mental health issue in their workplace, whether it's with their supervisor or human resources. Um, and so sometimes we have to find out less directly. Sometimes the way it comes up is concerns raised by others. You may have um, colleagues of the employee come to you and start saying, things have changed with this employee lately. They're, um, they're crying a lot. They're it seems like they haven't taken a shower in a month. You know, they're they're getting angry at people for no reason or they're starting to talk about, you know, conspiracy theories. So sometimes you might become aware of a concern from someone else in the workplace. Another way you might find out about a mental health issue is by noticing changes in performance. Now, when you notice a change in performance, there can be all kinds of causes that may or may not be mental health issues. So you're not going to assume that just because someone is tardy a lot, that that means they're having mental health issues. They may be having car issues. They may be having childcare issues. There may be all sorts of other reasons for that situation. But if you notice absenteeism, tardiness, problems meeting deadlines, or a noticeable change in work quality, that may trigger the, at least the idea that there could be a mental health issue. And I want to mention that when it comes to changes in work quality, that could include both positive and negative changes in work quality. Sometimes someone going through a mental health issue may actually do more work and do better work. They may be obsessing um, and being perfectionist about their work, or they may be going through a manic uh, period where they are working longer and harder hours at all times of night. So it may not be something that you would traditionally view as a negative, yet it could still be a product of someone having a mental health issue. Uh, you should also 
be thinking about behavioral signs? Do you see someone crying at work frequently? Or are they suddenly belligerent with coworkers when otherwise things had been going pretty well with them? Do you notice that in meetings, it seems like they're not paying attention at all? Changes in grooming habits, um, changes in mood or stress levels. Again, some of those can, changes can go in both directions. But if you see some of those signs, that could be an indication that someone is having a mental health issue. Now, you're not going to diagnose any kinds of mental health issues. That is not your job unless you are an appropriate professional to be doing that. And even then, you're not doing it for your employees. You're doing it for your patients. Um, but just to be alert to the fact that someone may be going through something and that that issue might need some attention. And we'll talk about how you deal with that. So let's talk for a moment about prevalence of mental health issues. You know, um, there was a time when people thought mental health issues were very, very rare. I think now that a lot of the stigma has been reduced, we're seeing that you know, it's regular people that you encounter in the workplace who have mental health issues, not necessarily, you know, kind of maybe a picture some people may have in their minds of, oh, yes, you know, if someone has a mental health issue, that means that they're crazy and locked up in an asylum. You know, that idea is not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis who may be dealing with uh, some kind of mental health condition. So approximately one in five adults in the United States experiences mental illness. The most common are anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. And, um, you know, a, a very large number of adults are experiencing those disorders at any given time. And they, they can be episodic. So someone may have um, a seri uh, may, an episode of major depression for a year and then maybe never have it again or have it 10 years later. So uh, it doesn't mean that some someone who has one of those conditions is experiencing it at all times. Uh, I think we've seen statistically that the pandemic did a real number on mental health for pretty much every group and population across the country. Um, since the pandemic, 81% of workplaces have increased their focus on employee mental health, but one in three employees still feel that the support they receive for mental health in the workplace is inadequate. Um, we're not going to focus very much on how to kind of create a positive workplace culture, um, you know, kind of safe climate ideas. We're going to really have more of a legal focus, but it's important to realize that if you care about the mental well-being of your staff, that you should, you know, be giving attention Two things like how are we avoiding burnout? Do we have people who are overly aggressive or overly demanding in the workplace? And how are we going to address those issues? We see that nearly half of employees said their mental well being declined in 2022, and 28% said they are miserable in their workplace. So this is a huge number, and you are going to see the ramifications of that through requests for leave, requests for accommodations, or just poor quality work. Um, and we see that only 13% of employees feel comfortable discussing their mental health in the workplace, which means there may be a lot of issues that are occurring under your radar because people are unwilling to discuss it. So, you know, again, the takeaway from this is that this is something that is widespread as an issue in the workplace. People are in, enormously stressed out. They are suffering from anxiety and depression as well as other mental health conditions. And we need to find ways to um, secure their rights in the workplace, as well as hopefully do what we can as employers to decrease some of those burdens. So some of the general considerations you want to have when thinking about and dealing with employee mental health issues is to avoid stereotyping. We don't want to make assumptions about what mental illness looks like. Again, it's not, you know, the I, those old fashioned ideas about, you know, it's someone who's crazy in an asylum. It's, you know, people that you encounter every single day and may never have any idea that there's a mental health issue um, and everything in between. You want to avoid stigma. Um, you want to create a workplace culture as much as possible that 
does not create or reinforce the stigmas that exist in the world about employee mental health issues. And you want to create a climate, especially if you're a supervisor or a human resources professional, where people can ask for the accommodations um, or support they need without being afraid that they will now forever be seen as that person with the mental health issue. So as much as you can keep the discourse in the workplace positive and professional in general, that will certainly help uh, reduce the stigma. We want to respect employees' privacy, um, at least as much as you would with other health issues, which is, it should be a pretty high level of privacy. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires confidentiality around employee health issue, health information. So you want to respect employees' privacy as much as possible. And of course, given that unfortunately there is a stigma around mental health issues, perhaps even more so. Uh, we want to have empathy when dealing with um, these situations and do your best to understand the situation from the employee's perspective without making comparisons to others or what you think you would do in a similar situation because we're all different. And so, you know, some people may be in enormous grief after the loss of a parent and have a real difficult time functioning. And maybe you got back to work two days later and never slowed down. And, you know, if you make those kinds of comparisons, it's not empathetic and it doesn't help the person to get to a better place. So we want to have empathy in those situations as well. And finally, productivity and safety, right? We're in business to do business. And there's a perception sometimes that I will sacrifice productivity or I will sacrifice safety if I care about an employee situation and I try to, um, you know, reduce their expectations or accommodate them in some way that somehow that's sacrificing productivity and safety. And you'll see that in most circumstances, they're does not need to be a sacrifice. Sometimes you may actually gain productivity and safety by addressing the issue. Um, and certainly by complying with the legal requirements, that's a necessary fact as well. So when we think about employment law, generally the same law is going to apply to mental and physical issues. So for example, the, the state and federal FMLAs both cover serious health conditions, which include mental health issues. There's no distinction. It, it, if it checks the right boxes um, under I, the FMLA or Connecticut FMLA, it doesn't matter whether the condition is a mental one or a physical one. Uh, the Connecticut Fair Employment Practices Act defines disability very broadly, uh, and that prohibits disability discrimination in the workplace. Um, as well as requiring a reasonable accommodation. And that includes for anything in the Diagnostic and, and Statistical Manual, the DSM. So that's what mental health professionals use to diagnose mental health conditions. And if it's in the DSM, by definition, it is considered a mental disability under Connecticut law. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a bit narrower and has some exceptions that are not included in Connecticut law. Um, but because the Connecticut law is so broad, generally speaking, we're not concerned so much with the ADA and its analysis of is a person substantially limited in a major life activity uh, because we're operating here in Connecticut. Um, workers' compensation law in Connecticut, emotional injuries usually are not covered. So typically, for example, if my boss is mean to me and that causes me anxiety, depression, and so on, that would not typically be covered under workers' compensation law. Uh, it can be covered if there's a physical component, but generally speaking, it, emotional injuries are not covered. There are exceptions that were created in the law for witnessing death or catastrophic injury. It used to be very limited with respect to first responders. It's now being broadened to cover all employees. So that is a change um, if that comes up in your line of work. Um, and finally, there's the Connecticut paid sick leave law. This is not the same as the Connecticut paid family leave. This is the law that gives uh, service workers up to 40 hours in a uh, year for um, various kinds of illness or family illnesses. It, you know, it, you could take it off for the sniffles. It doesn't have to be 
because of um, a serious health condition or disability. And so there's uh, mental health coverage under the Connecticut Paid Sick Leave Law as well. So when we talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, um, it applies to employers with uh, 15 or more employees as well as um, state and local governments. And it prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability and employment among several other kinds of provisions. It requires that the employer provide a reasonable accommodation to qualified individuals with disabilities. Uh, the ADA imposes other restrictions, including questions that can be asked about an applicant's or employee's health. So you, the ADA would generally prohibit an employer from randomly asking about an employee's medical conditions, but there are provisions to do so when needed. Um, and the protection applies to qualified individuals with a disability, including those regarded as disabled. So maybe I think you have a disability, but you actually don't. Or those with a record of a disability, meaning maybe you used to have a disability and you don't anymore. Uh, one of the key concepts under the ADA is um, direct threat. So a direct threat is a significant risk of substantial harm to the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced through reasonable accommodation. Um, and it has to be based on objective factual evidence, including the best recent medical evidence. So you can't say, oh, this employee has depression. I can't let them in my workplace where they're around children because they might harm themselves in front of the kids. It needs to be a lot more specific, a lot more detailed than that. There needs to be a very, you know, a much more meaningful threat. Um, so the employer has to evaluate the individual's ability to safely perform the job and consider things like the duration of the risk, what's the severity of the potential harm, the likelihood of the potential harm, and the imminence of the potential harm. So it's really supposed to be for those real situations of an actual threat, not a theoretical threat. And the direct threat analysis actually, uh, you know, came out very much from the HIV AIDS um, concerns in the, you know, especially in the early 90s. And it was basically saying, we want to make sure that people who have HIV or AIDS can uh, work in the workplace without people worrying about the toilet seat. And so this is kind of the same idea that just because someone has a mental health condition doesn't mean they are dangerous. We have to be a lot more specific in how we evaluate a threat. So the Connecticut statute actually doesn't have a direct threat provision, but it does allow um, us to discriminate regarding someone with a disability in the case of a bona fide occupational qualification or need. So that's where you could take the ability to do the job safely into account because that would be a bona fide occupational qualification or need. Okay, so what do we do about reasonable accommodations? Um, this is required under both the federal and the state law for someone who has a disability. So if a person has a disability and they can do the job and there's no issue doing the job in the workplace, you don't need to do anything. But if the person with the disability is not going to have equal employment opportunity because of their dis because of their disability, then they can have a change in the work environment or the way things are customarily done in order to facilitate that. So we are trying to make sure that the person has the ability to do the essential job functions, and we do not need to get rid of an essential job function in order to um, accommodate a disability, but we may need to get rid of a marginal job function. So it's important to know which ones are essential and which ones aren't. So the essential job functions are the most important duties, the kind of the reason you have this job in the first place. Um, and not every duty is an essential duty. So for example, um, as a lawyer, I give presentations as I am doing right now, but if I had a phobia regarding public speaking, you might think, well, how can someone be a lawyer if they can't do public speaking? Well, what if their job is drafting wills and contracts? And they don't really need to do public speaking for their job. They don't need to go to court. And it can be done that they don't have a problem with one-on-one -on -one communications. So maybe you would like them to do presentations, but you realize that, you know, the other people in their same department give maybe one or two presentations a year. 
Is it really an essential job function or is that a marginal job function? So you can look at the duties and make that assessment. So it's a case by case basis. And this is often where there's, you know, argument over what's essential and what's not, because maybe someone can do a job function um, that they, or they can't do a job function and you're saying it's essential and they're saying it is, you know, 1% of my job. It's just really not that important. So if an employee can perform the essential job functions with a reasonable accommodation, then you have to provide that reasonable accommodation unless the accommodation itself would pose an undue hardship. And the employer has the right to select from any effective accommodation. So it does not need to be the accommodation of the employee's choice. Uh, sometimes this is where there's some battleground too. We've been seeing things uh, where an employee says, I want my reasonable accommodation to be to work from home. And maybe we're really trying to get people back in the workplace. And we could say, well, a private office might also suffice for your needs. And if we can determine that that would also be an effective accommodation, then we can choose to do that rather than allow the remote work, even though the employee really wants the remote work. So what are some reasonable accommodations? You could have a change of shift times, for example, including flexible time. So maybe, you know, this won't work in a job where it's really important that the person be there at specific times. But if you are in a retail establishment and there's shifts beginning at staggered times, and maybe someone with depression really struggles to get out of bed in the morning, but would be a very good worker starting at 1 p.m., you could change that. You could allow flexibil flexibility in the scheduling if that is consistent with the needs of your job. Sometimes you don't care when the work is done as long as it gets done. And sometimes it's very important to have coverage at a particular place at a particular time. So change of shift times may be a reasonable accommodation. Breaks can be a reasonable accommodation. Um, you know, sometimes it is just that the person gets overloaded and needs an opportunity to calm down or they're having an anxiety attack and they need an opportunity to calm down. And some of these apply to physical conditions too. You know, if maybe someone needs a break because they can't be on their feet that long or they are experiencing a migraine. So there may be physical ailments as well, but we're focusing on mental health. Allowing a support animal. So this one I'll just mention because it's a hot topic right now. Um, the ADA requires that uh, local governments, as well as places of public accommodation, let's say like a movie theater, allow service animals. A service animal specifically has to be a dog or a miniature horse, and it needs to be trained to perform a particular task. That's a service animal. And those public places don't need to allow support animals for patrons. but when that's very specific to people trying to utilize these public accommodations. When you're talking about employment law, it's a different section of the ADA and it doesn't get into this whole animal issue. And so because it doesn't get into this whole animal issue, a support animal is no different than any other reasonable accommodation like breaks or change of shift times. You go through the same analysis. You go through, is it... Um, is it going to allow the person to perform the essential job functions? Is it an undue hardship? Is there some other effective accommodation? And it's because it's not about service animals, it's just the same as any other accommodation. There's no limitation on what kind of animal it can be. So for example, um, if someone wanted to bring a cat to the office for support or a bird or fish, you would look at that the same way you would look at any other request for a reasonable accommodation. The animal piece doesn't really factor in very much. Um, allowing a support person for meetings may also be a um, reasonable accommodation. Um, I'm going to actually pause and answer one of the questions here. Can someone be covered under ADA during probationary period? Absolutely. Every single one of these laws, unless they relate to, you know, you have to have worked for a specific amount of time, which I'll tell you if that's part of the law. They all apply from the beginning. And in fact, the ADA 
and the, the right to not be discriminated against for disability begins before employment. So for example, if you have an applicant who is blind and can't complete the job application because you're handing them a piece of paper and a pen, but they can answer it verbally, you need to start making that accommodation now. And then you'll, you know, look, if the job is going to not work because the person is blind, you know, you're hiring them to be a driver. Clearly that's not going to work, but you don't want to make a snap judgment either. There are plenty of blind people doing uh, jobs that, you know, you may rely on your site to do that kind of job, but it doesn't mean that that person would rely on their site to do that kind of job. So the ADA applies from the very beginning, even before employment. Um, so great question there. I, I see some questions about leave. I'm going to deal with those later on in the program. Um, allowing a support person for meetings uh, could also be an accommodation. Telecommuting, this hot topic after COVID, people really want to continue working from home. It depends on the position, depends on the undue hardship, depends on the availability of another effective accommodation. They may need a private work area to be free from distractions um, or social anxiety concerns. Sometimes they may need an unpaid leave of absence for a specific period, and sometimes this can be tacked on to FMLA leave. So we'll, we're going to talk about FMLA, but I just want to mention that someone can be eligible for a leave of absence as a reasonable accommodation. So sometimes it's tacked on to the end of an FMLA leave. I'll also point out, though, to that question I just got about how quickly the ADA kicks in. The ADA kicks in from day one, unlike some of these leave laws. So if you have an employee who's been with you for one week and says, I need to go to a treatment program for my mental health condition, you need to at least consider it as a reasonable accommodation and determine whether it's an undue hardship or not, even though they're not eligible for FMLA at that time. You may need to organize tasks or space in a particular way, again, to maybe deal with ADHD challenges. Um, uh, elimination of distractions, very similar kinds of concerns. So those are just some examples of reasonable accommodations that might tend to come up. Some unreasonable accommodations, because people say, well, where's the line? Can't they get anything then? So eliminating an essential function would be considered unreasonable. Um, by the way, you could choose to do that, but that's just you being nice. It's not required. You're not required to lower uniformly applied production standards. Um, so if everybody has to make a thousand widgets a year, then this person also has to make a thousand widgets yeah. a year. You can't reasonable accommodation your way out of that. Um, indefinite leaves of absence or complete disregard, you know, the person comes and goes as they please. That's not a reasonable accommodation. Um, you don't have to supply personal use items like reading glasses or hearing aids. Um, you don't need to change the person's supervisor. Keep that one in your back pocket because so much of the time, these are my soup. I can't get along with my supervisor. It's causing me anxiety. It's causing me stress. And I'm going to make a reasonable accommodation for a different supervisor. It's not a reasonable accommodation. You don't need to do it. However, if you look at the situation and you think, gosh, you know, I could really improve morale around here if I just move this person to the other department and it'll work out great, then nothing stops you from doing that. You just want to make sure that you understand you're not required to do that. Uh, you're not required to make sure someone takes their medication um, and you're not required to create a job that doesn't exist or push someone else out of a job to let this person do that job. So um, those are just all things that are not required by the ADA or Connecticut Fair Employment Practices Act as a reasonable accommodation. So when an employee comes to you and says, I need a reasonable accommodation, you need to engage in what's called the interactive process. You don't just say no if you think their idea is unworkable. If you think their idea is fine, you can just say yes, that, that's okay. And then maybe talk about how you're going to make it work in practice. But, you know, an employee who comes to you and says, you know, because of my depression, it's hard to get out of bed. Can I start at 10? They haven't used any magic words, but they are making a reasonable accommodation. So maybe they can't start at 10. It, it would be terrible for you if they start at 10, but you could make it work that they could leave earlier and maybe get to sleep earlier. And maybe you start going back and forth and discussing that. Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes, you know, an employee with a back issue, they just need a chair. Great. Done. You know, um, but sometimes it's complicated and very difficult because the person really wants to change a lot about how the job is done. 
Um, you should look to the employee for suggestions and look to the treatment provider for suggestions. Um, ultimately, the employer does decide among effective accommodations. I specify effective accommodations because you can't just say, we're not doing that, we're doing this instead, when you really have no reason to think that that's going to actually deal, resolve the problem. So if you're going to say, nope, there's no accommodation that could possibly make this work, um, you should really consult counsel before doing that because effectively you're firing the person. Um, and you want to make sure that before you say an outright no, that you really have ruled out all possibilities um, and that you're thinking creatively. Um, you Generally, it's on the employee to initiate the interactive process, but you should do it without being asked if you know of the disability and you know that the employee is hindered in asking because of it. Now, I typically think of this in connection with maybe someone who has an intellectual disability that would prevent them from self-advocacy, but I also think, you know, maybe social anxiety could be a great situation where the person really is so afraid to ask for an accommodation for the social anxiety because of the social anxiety. So if you can come to them and say, I notice you have panic attacks, you know, when we ask you to do public speaking, is that, you know, are you okay? Would you, do you want to talk about how we can handle that? Is that, would you prefer not doing public speaking? Let's talk. And then you're initiating that interactive process. So, um, and if you say to a person, hey, I see you're having an issue. Is there some accommodation you need? And they say, nope, I'm good then you've done what you need to do. All right, so what can you ask? In a pre-hire phase, you can confirm that the applicant can perform the essential job functions with or without accommodations. You're really not supposed to be asking disability-related questions. But if someone walks in, you know, and they're, they obviously have a, men uh, they obviously have a, disability, um, I'm gonna take it outside of mental health for a moment, say they're clearly blind, and the position, the way you think it ought to be done, would require them to be able to see. You might say, so how would you do this job? Oh, I use screen reader software. I, um, you know, here's how I navigate around buildings. And they give you an answer. And that's fine. So you can ask if it's obvious or if the employee or the applicant tells you about the disability. You can say, okay, how would you do your work in light of that disability? Um, once you make a conditional offer, the employer can ask disability related questions and require medical examinations as long as you do the same thing for everyone entering in that job category. It's it's not a one off situation. Um, once the person is employed, you can only ask medical questions when it's job related and consistent with business necessity. So you really want to limit that. And generally, that tends to come up more when someone is asking for an accommodation or you're noticing an issue and you need to figure out what to do. So when a reasonable accommodation is requested, then you need to ask enough to confirm your legal ob obligation. So you can ask for medical documentation that confirms the employee has a covered disability uh, that requires a reasonable accommodation, ask about the functional limitations, um, and we can choose to send the employee for our own exam if the employee doesn't provide enough information. When it comes to supervision and discipline, of employees with mental health issues, we wanna make sure we're applying the same performance standards across the board. We're not treating them better or worse than anyone else. Um, if there's a disciplinary issue, let's say a profanity-laden outburst, if the disability did not cause the misconduct, then we would impose discipline in the same manner. But let's say that person has Tourette syndrome and it appears that it's a result of the Tourette syndrome, then you discipline only if the, the conduct rule is job related and consistent with business necessity. So, you know, maybe if it was in front of three year olds, you might need to do something a little bit differently or they violated um, a workplace violence rule. Then you might need to to address it. But um, the other thing is reasonable accommodation is always prospective. So an employer doesn't excuse past misconduct, even if it's the result of the individual's disability. So you can't, the individual can't just say after the fact, oh, it's because of my mental health issue and get out of it. Um, the employer cannot disclose that an employee is receiving a reasonable accommodation to other people. So sometimes your actions may be perceived as unfair 
because people don't know the whole story. Um, you can talk to supervisors and managers about the work restrictions and accommodations, but not go into detail as to why. Um, and again, you don't want to be ignoring signs that an employee may be suffering from a disability requiring a reasonable accommodation. You want to be proactive. Moving away from accommodations, because I want to make sure we uh, get time to talk about these other laws as well. Um, under the Connecticut Paid Sick Leave Law, nearly all public and private employers with 50 or more employees are required to provide paid sick leave to certain employees referred to as service workers. One of the biggest exceptions under this law is manufacturers. So if you're a manufacturer, this doesn't apply to you unless you have a separate office facility. But um, so what just went into effect on October 1st is now one of the valid reasons an employee can take leave under this um, provision is a mental health wellness day, which is defined as a day during which a service worker, which basically is an employee covered under this law, attends to their emotional and psychological well-being in lieu of attending a regularly scheduled shift. It does not say you need to have a disability. It does not say you need to have a serious health condition, meaning I could say, I'm really, really stressed out. I want to stay home. And that would be sufficient under this law. Um, so if you have uh, policies or collective bargaining agreements that limit the use of sick days, and you are a covered employer under this law, you may need to change the language in those policies to include mental health wellness days. Uh, there's no expansion in the overall amount of time that is allowed to be taken under the Connecticut paid sick leave law, just this becomes an extra reason. It's a privileged reason someone can call out. Um, and we're gonna talk about FMLA in a second. Um, I have a question, does that cover municipalities? Yes, it does. Again, only for the service workers, which is a large percentage of the workforce generally. Um, I will deal with the lengthier questions a little bit down the road when um, time permitting and feel free to stick on at the end too. All right, federal FMLA. If you have 50 or more employees, this applies to you. Um, <laughs> municipal employers, small municipalities, may be covered, but if there's fewer than 50 employees, you may not actually have to give leave. Uh, if that applies to you and you have questions about that, feel free to give me a call. It's a little tricky. But basically, FMLA generally gives 12 weeks per year of uh, job, job protected unpaid leave for certain reasons. This is the federal FMLA. This um, And you need to restore the person to a substantially equivalent job. You can require or the employee can choose to use their paid time off first, and that counts as part of the leave time. You're not delaying the FMLA while they use up the vacation time. It's concurrent. Connecticut FMLA applies when there's a minimum employment period of three months and there's no hours requirements, not that 1,250 hours. So if someone's worked for you for three months, you have one or more employees in Connecticut, and you are... Uh, private sector and not an educational institution, I think I covered all the carve-outs there, you are covered under Connecticut FMLA. If you employ a nanny, you are covered under Connecticut FMLA. It is a very um, generous law. So it applies to very small employers um, because it, it, you only need one employee. The leave runs concurrently with federal FMLA if you are covered under that law as well. Uh, you... The part that you're dealing with, the, the administration of the unpaid leave, that part is unpaid, but the employee may be eligible for pay from the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. Um, and just like before with the federal FMLA, either one can um, choose to have paid time off run concurrently with it. But in Connecticut FMLA, the employee is allowed to retain up to two weeks of um time off. I have two questions. Will slides be available after the webinar? Yes, please contact me my, um, and I will uh, provide the slides. Does the mental health wellness days apply to nonprofits? Uh, yes, it does. There's a very limited exception for like Boy Scout, Girl Scout kinds of operations, but almost everyone else, yes. Um, and that's, again, they have to have 50 or more um, employees to be under that. Okay. So moving on. Okay, so under both the federal FMLA and the state FMLA, you need to have a serious health condition in order to qualify. Um, there are, you could take it for family members too, but focusing just on taking it for yourself for the moment, 
I'm not going to read through this, but basically you need to have um, some level of incapacity because of the condition or have absences for multiple treatments for the condition. Uh, substance abuse is one we get asked about a lot. FMLA leave is available for substance abuse um, provided for, for treatment, not because of the use itself, um, provided the requirements of serious health condition are met. Um, you can take action against an employee for violating a work rule, like if they came to work drunk, but you're not taking action because they are seeking to go to rehab. So it's a distinction you have to be very attentive to. Um, an employee may be terminated um, if there's a substance abuse policy that kind of clearly addresses the situation. And if an employee is taking leave to deal with a family member with substance abuse, obviously there's no disciplinary action for that. That's not their own substance abuse. Um, all right, so we sometimes run into issues like notice. Um, the employee does not need to say FMLA, but they do need to give you enough information that you know it's an FMLA qualifying reason. Um, the notice could be very minimal. Someone could have a panic attack right now and you don't get to plan for that. So understand it may be last minute. Um, here are some examples of, um, you know, how courts have looked at vague expressions of a need for leave, but, you know, again, be proactive. If you think it might be FMLA qualifying, start thinking about FMLA. In terms of certification, understand that when we get a certification back from a doctor for FMLA, it doesn't need to include the diagnosis, but it does need to kind of check all the boxes that it meets serious health condition. Um, we want to at least make sure that the provider seems to match up to the situation. We can consider a second opinion um, if there is um, a reason to doubt the initial certification. But if they... Um, return the certification. And even if it's fairly generic, if it checks all the boxes, we have to acknowledge it. Um, if the employee has not returned the medical certification on time and there's no extenuating circumstances, then we can deny the leave. Um, leave does not need to be taken all at once. Sometimes it's episodic, either uh, because the condition is episodic or because of um, you know planned medical appointments. When it's for planned leave, um, for medical appointments, for example, we can require them to try to work around our schedule subject to the approval of the healthcare provider. All right, handling issues with sensitivity. We want to make sure that we are talking about things in the right way. So we want to address the employee's questions with a focus on the facts and how the issue is um, affecting the workplace. So if in you know, you wouldn't want to say to an employee, you keep missing deadlines, what's wrong with you? But again, factually, you know, until recently, meeting deadlines has been one of your strengths. But there were three times this month that you were more than a day late on a deadline. It's making it difficult for others to meet their deadlines. What's going on? And again, you may not know it's a mental health issue. It could be something totally different. But it, op it opens the conversation in a way that invites them to share their concerns. And it's not so harsh or insensitive that they won't want to talk to you. You don't want to draw comparisons. When I got divorced, I threw myself into my work. Why can't you do the same, right? You say, you seem to be having trouble concentrating during meetings. You mentioned that you're getting treatment for depression after your divorce and the depression makes it hard to con concentrate. That's understandable, but we need to make sure everyone's engaged. Is there a reasonable accommodation? Maybe we could hold the meetings earlier in the day. Um, would that allow you to focus better? And it's again, open, non-judgmental, and you're not telling them they should handle their divorce as, you know, better because you handled yours better. Um, don't diagnose, you know, my uncle's hairdresser had the exact same issue. I, I think you have adult ADHD. He did cognitive behavioral therapy and took Ritalin and that helped him a lot. You should do that. Completely inappropriate for a supervisor or an HR professional to be doing that. Let them know you have an employee assistance program, give them the number, show some support, don't diagnose and don't give treatment advice. Uh, you want to establish appropriate boundaries. Sometimes people are too nice and they say, hey, anytime you want to unload your problems, you can come to me. I'm here to listen whenever you need. We're behind you 100%. We'll do anything you want to do your job, to help you do your job. Oh boy, what did you just sign up for, right? You want to be realistic. 
So a better example is I can help you by explaining the benefits available to you and discussing reasonable accommodations to help remove barriers to doing your job. Um, we want to use appropriate language. You know, how could you possibly drive a bus when you can lose your mind at any moment? Okay, maybe that's what you're thinking, but your psychiatrist certification stated that there are periods when you may lose contact with reality. We're concerned that this may create safety issues when you're driving the bus. We plan to send you for a fitness for duty examination to ensure you're able to perform your job safely. I mean, you're still going to get to the same place, but it's how you say it. You don't want to understate issues. You know, so you're depressed, but that doesn't mean you can't get to work on time. Everyone else manages. But, you know, if you're going to be late, we need you to let us know right away so we can get coverage. Much better. Don't overstate issues. We've seen you crying at your desk lately. You have so much to live for. Please don't kill yourself. You know, maybe just because someone's crying doesn't mean that they're at that level. And especially if you're saying that just because, you know, they have a diagnosis of depression, you're really stigmatizing and going very far if, if you're not seeing that level of concerning behavior. But you could say, we've seen you crying at your desk lately. Is everything okay? And again, just invite the conversation. Sometimes coworkers are concerned. So if a coworker comes to you and they say, hey, this person is you seeming off lately, you can talk about the concern with the employee, but try to avoid naming names if possible because you want to respect that this person came to you trying to solve a problem. Um, you don't want to share personal or medical information with coworkers, even if the employee seems open about it. It's one thing if they share, it's very different if HR or supervisor does so. Um, if you see someone harassing or mistreating the employee with the disability, address it the same as any other unlawful harassment, like sexual harassment or racial harassment. Make sure you are actively fostering a culture of respect. And if the disabled employee is mistreating others, perhaps as a result of the disability, consider legal options. You might need to do a fitness for duty examination, for example, to ensure safety if you believe that this person is a threat to themselves or others in the workplace. So some of the common problems, and really you need to call a lawyer to deal with these in real time. I can't give you, you know, a one size fits all solution now. And these are the toughest cases. Employees abusing FMLA, employee expects special treatment. They, um, they're not doing their job, but then they say everything's retaliation. Um, their disabilities are so burdensome to accommodate that you don't know how to do it, but you know you have to. Um, the employees taking FML, intermittent FMLA and not, not without legitimacy, but it's so unpredictable that you're having a hard time dealing with it. Um, or the employee claims anxiety induced by a supervisor. Those are some of the real challenging ones to deal with. So those are ones where you really ought to be consulting with counsel from the get-go. I'm um, going to just see if there are any quick questions before we get to the scenarios. Otherwise, again, I will say it for the end. Uh, the mental health day part does not apply to manufacturing because manufacturers are not under the Connecticut paid sick leave law. However, if you have a separate facility, like there's office-based work and manufacturing-based work and they're in separate locations, then the non-manufacturing components would be covered. But if it's a single unit, then uh, manufacturers are not under the Connecticut paid sick leave law. Um, can you cover... Existing PT, can your existing PTO cover the mental health wellness days? Yes, the mental health wellness days are part of your sick leave or PTO. And as long as you are providing that in accordance with the Connecticut paid sick leave law, because that's what this is, it's saying you have to provide sick leave, then the mental health wellness days are covered under that. You can use a, a generalized PTO bank to cover it. That would be fine. Um, okay. The I see about the preferred term is substance use or substance use disorder. I am referencing the legal terminology under the um the statutes which sometimes takes time to catch up to the um the current uh preferred terms um all right i'll answer the more situational how would you deal with this ones um when we get to the end just to make sure we get through the scenarios uh all right. Nancy is a secretary who has been diagnosed with alcoholism. She finds it difficult to get out of bed after a night of drinking and seeks to change her shift time from 8 a.m. until 9 as a reasonable accommodation. She wants to work an hour later in the afternoon. In the past, other employees with disabilities have been granted the same accommodation. Alternatively, she would like to take intermittent FMLA leave when she has a hangover. So 
Um, given the forum and the timing, I'm probably just going to start answering, but I it, feel free to chime in if you have um, a discussion point on this. Um, because Nancy uh, has been diagnosed with alcoholism, that is a disability. Um, and the employer can't discriminate against her for having the disability. Um, and it does not need to do uh, to engage in a reasonable accommodation that result from the drinking. If she needed time off to go to AA meetings, let's say that would be a different story and, and the accommodation would be necessary. But you don't need to accommodate the drinking. And FMLA leave is not available for hangovers. It's available for treatment, for example. So she could take leave or have an accommodation to deal with her alcoholism, but not to deal with the fact that she um you know, is experiencing side effects from the drinking after the fact. Um, again, the employer cannot discriminate against her for having alcoholism. So they can't just say, oh, wow, she's an alcoholic. Let's fire her. We don't want people like that here. That would not be allowed. Um, okay. Mark has been missing deadlines and making frequent mistakes. Oh, I just want to go back on Nancy. I would refer her to the employee assistance program if we have one. All right. Um, Mark has been missing deadlines and making frequent mistakes. Whenever his supervisor tries to meet with him to go over his evaluation, he takes a sick day. He claims the supervisor is harassing him whenever he documents his poor performance or attempts to meet with him about client complaints. Mark is placed on an improvement plan requiring weekly meetings with the supervisor. He immediately submits a note from a nurse practitioner stating that he suffers from anxiety and demands that the improvement plan and any discipline be removed since they were a result of his anxiety. Mark warns that if he is ever required to meet with the supervisor about performance issues, this will constitute continued harassment and retaliation, and he will file a civil rights charge. So what are our obligations? What do we do? First of all, definitely when someone's threatening they're going to file a charge, if you, you know, treat them like you would any other employee, that's a good time to be calling your lawyer to help make sure you manage everything really perfectly. Um but you're not required to eliminate performance standards. He's also seeking an accommodation um, retrospectively, which you're not required to do. Um, given that he takes sick day whenever a supervisor tries to meet with him to go over his evaluation, and we now know that he has anxiety, um, we might try to see, is there some other way to deliver the feedback? He can't escape the feedback, but he might be able to avoid having it as a meeting. Perhaps we could give it to him in writing only. Perhaps we could agree to give him the feedback in writing followed by a meeting. We could allow him to have a support person at the meeting. There are things we can do, uh, but we are going to continue to to manage Mark like we would any other employee, but make some accommodations um, to enable him to receive the feedback better. Uh, the fact that the note is from a nurse practitioner rather than a doctor is not a concern. Um, the, these laws are very broad in terms of who can um, submit a medical note. And we're not going to be removing any discipline just because um, it was a result of his anxiety. But we can certainly take into account um, when thinking about his performance that if we think it was about his anxiety and he once we put in some accommodations, he can do better, then we'll we'll have that full picture. Um, scenario three, Susan is requesting intermittent FMLA leave due to panic attacks. Human Resources asks her to have her health care provider complete the certification paperwork. Susan refuses, stating that under HIPAA, her health information is private and her employer has no right to force her to provide it. She threatens to sue if the employer does not grant her leave. Can Susan refuse to provide the paperwork? What should the employer do if she does? Yes, Susan can refuse to provide the paperwork, but she's not getting her FMLA leave. Um, if she is requesting leave, we have the right to require the certification paperwork. Um, and so the, and HIPAA does not apply to the situation. People think HIPAA applies to everything. It generally has very little to do with the employment relationship subject to very limited situations. Um, but in most workplaces, HIPAA really has nothing to do with anything. So if she's requesting FMLA, then she needs to provide the paperwork. If she doesn't want to provide it, then uh, we're not going to be, have enough information to certify the leave. Um, you may consider reminding her that her medical information is private. It won't be shared beyond human resources, you know, maybe quell the concerns that way, but uh, she does have to provide it. 
All right. Now, um, I see there are several questions, um, and these might take more than the four minutes remaining to answer. So if you uh, choose not to stay on uh, the call for the, these questions, that's fine, but I will try to go through them. Um, all right, I see one that says, we are a small company, so I can personally assist in these cases. However, in very large um, retail companies, how does a person in one of the stores get help applying for FMLA or navigating the system with their own store manager, has no idea what to do? Is there any help in the state of Connecticut for a person in this situation? Great question. Um, so for large retail companies, um, they usually have point people designated. Either it's human resources or a lot of them will have like a third party vendor that just handles their FMLA claims or leave of absence um, requests. And so uh, it might be an 800 number for the employee to call. That should be in employee handbooks and employee notices, how the person um, requests FMLA. And if you don't have an employee handbook, you should. And if you are a smaller, uh, if you're a um, small employer under the Connecticut FMLA or your larger employer under federal FMLA, you have notice obligations uh, to employees. So make sure you're posting those uh, posters as well. They don't necessarily tell you who in the company to go to, but they make sure employees know that they uh, can ask for leave. Um, if an employee previously provided notice of quitting, but then a medical issue happened prior to leaving and the employer assisted with paperwork for the Connecticut Paid Leave Benefit, how long are employers legally required to keep paying for medical benefits per policy? The employer covers half of the cost for the employee. So if the employee is on, so they're currently your employee, you, they were going to quit and then they unquit. Um, I, that's how I'm taking that. Um, you, so they're, they're taking the paid leave. You need to keep paying for the, if you're, their medical benefits to the extent that you would, if they weren't going to quit. Um, so that part would be the same. If the person is no longer working for you, no, um, and no longer meets your health insurance, um, qualifications, then you're talking about COBRA. I, I admit I don't fully understand the parameters of the question, but I hope that between those responses, um, you have the information. Um, we have an employee with type 1 diabetes requesting coming in late when needed to accommodate waking up with high blood sugar. If we agree to, for example, twice a month can be accommodated in there late four times, can we discipline for the extra two? I don't see how you can really limit it in that way, as long as their reasons are legitimate. Um, I mean, it's like saying you can only have a diabetic episode twice a month. I I think for the most part, you want to look at it as can this be done or not. You Also, that lateness might be intermittent FMLA. You should be giving them FMLA paperwork because at least until they exhaust 12 weeks of that. So let's say they're an hour late. They work 40 hours a week until they use 480 hours of lateness. They're entitled to that. So you might um, really want to be looking at that under FMLA, not just accommodation. Uh, how do you tell if it is FMLA qualifying or someone excessively calling in sick? Does the employer need to tell them specifically that is an option other than the nose posters in the break room? So if you see what it, if they just say I'm out sick, no. But if you know a little bit about why they're out sick and it seems like it could be an FMLA qualifying reason, then yes. Or if they're out sick for you know three or more days, that might suggest that they have a condition that meets the three or more day incapacity window under serious health condition. So if it's just kind of I'm calling out here, I'm calling out there and I do it a lot of times, um, you don't necessarily need to do it, but I would still have an attendance discussion with that employee and say, what's going on? Why are you, why are you out so much? And if they say, oh, it's because of my arthritis or my depression or, you know, whatever the situation is, then you might be on notice for an FMLA qualifying reason. Uh, how do you handle an employee who's taking significantly more time than the medical certification allows? Example, one day off per week, but on the certification, but out of work three to four days per week. Uh, the FMLA has protocols for dealing with this. Basically, you can require recertification. You basically let the healthcare provider know what you're seeing and ask them if that is consistent. Um, you know, 
with the condition and that might be one way you spot abuse. So uh, another thing I'll mention is, by the way, sometimes people call FMLA the Friday and Monday Leave Act. Um, you know, they might notice a pattern like, huh, they only get migraines on Mondays. How interesting. But it could be that that is legitimate because it could be that, you know, the stress of returning to work after the weekend is triggering that. So you don't want to make an assumption, per se, that just because it follows a pattern that that means that it's abuse. Um do you need to issue both Connecticut and federal FMLA paperwork or is the FMLA paperwork enough even if you are in Connecticut when FMLA has been requested? If you are an employer who is subject to both, so meaning you have more than 50 employees, um, you know, for the most part, that's going to cover you on the federal, you should, you need to issue both paperwork because while they are largely similar, they are not identical. And so you can have someone who's eligible for one and not the other. Um, and so you definitely want to give the paperwork. Now, I think one certification form is enough, but in terms of the notice requirements and the designation notices, you want to cover your bases on both. Because, for example, if I take um, a leave to care for my um, mother-in-law, that would be covered under Connecticut, but not federal. And so I'm running down my 12 weeks on Connecticut, but I'm not running down my 12 weeks on federal. So it's separate designation notices should apply to those situations um, because then after I use my 12 weeks to take care of my mother-in-law of Connecticut leave, then I have my own me medical condition. Let's say I get another 12 weeks, but if you're thinking of them together and not segregating it out, you might miss that. Um, are there any resources on creating an employee assistance program or something our employees have suggested, but not sure where to start? There are third-party vendors that do this. You could probably Google like Employee Assistance Program Connecticut. I'm really not sure like who the good ones are, but you could also ask uh, colleagues in your industry uh, if they have recommendations for EAP providers, um, but it's something that is administered by a third party, not something you do internally. Uh, there's a question here, is there a specific amount of mental health days? So the, the Connecticut paid sick leave law has a very particular accrual situation. It's basically one hour of paid sick time for every 40 hours worked up to a cap of 40 per year, but you can also carry over 40, but then you can only use 40 in a year. So it's very specific. Um, in terms of the mental health days, there doesn't seem to be an independent limitation or independent delineation of it. So until, unless and until we get guidance that says, no, a mental health day is only one day or something like that, you should in infer that because they could get up to 40 hours of paid sick time, that um, whether it's used to take care because they have a stomach bug or used because they're taking care of their kid with a stomach bug or used because of their mental health day, that it all um, is coming out of that same pool of up to 40 hours um, per year, depending on how many hours they worked. Please clarify what was said about Connecticut manufacturer employees working in the actual manufacturing process, Connecticut. No, not Connecticut family medical leave, very important to differentiate. Connecticut paid sick leave law, which is a law that was from 2011, I believe that's the year, does not apply to the manufacturers in the actual, the the, the manufacturing company, or if there's some delineation, um, just the, the specific campus. But the Connecticut family medical leave absolutely does apply to manufacturers. And many manufacturers have 50 or more employees, and therefore the federal FMLA is likely to also apply to them. So for employers under 50, does the mental health wellness day apply? It does not. You cannot be subject to the Connecticut paid sick leave law unless you have at least 50 employees. There are people, there are entities above 50 that it may not apply to, but for employers under 50, you're not going to hit that threshold. So if you have 30 employees, you never need to give a mental health wellness day. Uh, again, you may have obligations to give uh, leave for someone having a mental health issue under a disability law or Connecticut FMLA, but not the mental health wellness day. Um, a full-time employee requested for a reduced schedule per reasonable accommodation. Do we provide this indefinitely or is there a cutoff time? If so, how do we prove an undue hardship? First of all, I would probably start with FMLA on this more than reasonable accommodation, as long as it meets the definition for a serious health condition, which if, if it's disability, it probably does. Um, 
So if you do this reduced schedule, it's really going to be sort of as long as it's needed or, but if you do, when you do it under Connecticut FMLA or federal FMLA, it's until the 12 weeks runs out. But remember, if you're reducing their schedule, so maybe they are working 10 fewer hours a week, but they were typically working 40 hours a week, then it would take 120 hours before they would, I'm sorry, it would take 400 80 hours of that reduction before they would run out. So sometimes you run into situations where the person will never run out um, and they could effectively, you know, work a part-time schedule indefinitely using FMLA the whole time. Um, if you do it as a reasonable accommodation, then there's possibly the undue hardship part. But I, but you really ought to be looking at this as an FMLA issue and um, certifying that as job protected leave. Uh, is a municipality covered under Connecticut paid sick leave? Yes, municipalities are covered under Connecticut paid sick leave if they have 50 or more employees, which virtually all do. Um, you know, they have to meet the definition of service worker in order to be covered. So it's a list of 69 different job classifications as to who's a service worker. So not every employee of a municipality is a service worker. But yes, municipalities are covered employers under the Connecticut paid sick leave law. What if one of my facilities has 30 employees and another facility has 110? Does the division under 100 qualify for the leave? Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about the Connecticut paid sick leave law um, or the FMLA on this. If you're talking about state FMLA, it's going to apply anyway, regardless of the size. If you're talking about federal FMLA, they have to have 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius of their work site. Um, so you could do the math on that. And if you're talking about the um, Connecticut paid sick leave law, then, um, and we're not talking about that manufacturing division, but just, you know, you have two locations of a non-manufacturing establishment, one has 30, one has 110, as long as they're the same company, then you, um, you're viewed as having more than 50. Did I get all the questions? We got through a lot of material and we went really um, quickly through it because we wanted to make sure to cover a lot. Um, I just want to remind you that um, you can reach out to me with any further questions or if I can um, assist your business. My email address is rgoldberg at birchamoses.com. That's R-G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G at B-E-R-C-H-E-M-M-O-S-E-S.com. And you can also, I'm going to put that back up on the screen too, because it's on this slide. Um, so you see it right there under my picture. I'll also give you my direct dial, which is 203-882-4105. Um, and again, please reach out to me. Uh, please sign up for that blog too, to stay apprised of uh, developments. I wrote about the mental health wellness days a few months ago, for example, you, you get kind of get to learn about these things as they happen. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to offer HRCI credits uh, for this training, but I uh, hope that it's valuable nonetheless. And um, with that, I thank you very much, um, everyone, for your time and attention today.